Welcome to Self Principle. As always, I'm Dr. Sean Hashmi. Self Principle is all about sleep, exercise, love, and eating a whole food plant-based diet. And this channel is really about answering all of your questions. So today's topic is all about vitamin K2. What do you need to know and should you really be taking it? So let's get started. Now the background on vitamin K2 is when you look at vitamin K, it was actually identified way back in 1936 and it's been around for a while. Now there are two main types. The first one is K1. That's what's found everywhere. But the one that's really interesting and the one that's actually has so much data about how it can improve so many aspects of your health is K2. And K1 is called philoquinone, but K2 is called menaquinone. When it comes to K2, there are several different subtypes or isoforms you want to be aware of. The main ones are MK4, MK7, MK8, and MK9. Now, if all of that sounds confusing and it's overwhelming, don't worry. We're going to get into the details and make sure you understand the most important things to take away from this talk so that you can start applying the benefits of K2 to your health. Now, the first question everybody asks is, well, where the heck do I get vitamin K from? When it comes to K1, K1 is easy because if you eat any kind of leafy greens, you're getting plenty of K1. In fact, it's very rare to see somebody who's actually deficient in K1. K2, on the other hand, is a lot harder to get. Now, one of the places where it's really rich is in natto. So if you eat natto, you're actually getting plenty of it. But if you're somebody who follows a whole food plant-based diet, otherwise, it's a little bit harder to get. For those people who eat things like meat and cheeses, it is found in a lot of different types of cheeses, chicken, sauerkraut, beef, pork, and things like salmon going on. But no fret. There are ways to make sure that you're getting plenty. Now, when it comes to natto and you're following a plant-based diet, natto is just a Japanese dish. It has the highest concentration of K2 of all the foods we've talked about. It's 10,985 nanograms per gram. And what is natto? It's nothing more than fermented soybeans. I remember one of my favorite foods is soy and is tofu. All right, when it comes to recommended daily intake. How much K should you be getting? Well, the answer is, is it's all based on K1. Therefore, we actually have no idea what is really the optimal dosing of K2. And we're hoping that there will be an RDI established, but that's more to come. When it comes to K2, just remember, we talked about some subtypes, right? MK4, MK7, MK8, MK9. What you want to know about K2 specifically is that if you take a supplement that says MK4, MK4 for vitamin K2 has very poor bioavailability, which means not only does it get absorbed very poorly, you're not going to see the levels inside your blood increase all that much. And K2 goes all over the body. If you look at K1, on the other hand, K1 really kind of hangs around your liver going on. Now, the one type of K2 that has the greatest bioavailability, that's MK7. So if you're going to take a K2 supplement, you want to make sure it's MK7 on the label going on. All right. What are some of the benefits going on of K2 and why should we care? Well, K2 is actually really helpful in carotid stiffness, in arterial stiffness. So what it means is, is there are some randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials that have looked at things like carotid femoral pulse wave velocity, which means how well the blood is flowing through. And they showed that after three years, that the stiffness in this, how stiff those blood vessels were, it actually decreases significantly going on there. And when you look at other data, where K2 really shines and is this concept of the calcification of arteries going on. So there's a Danish National Health Service prescription database. That's a mouthful. But essentially what they did was they were looking and what's going on in people who are taking long-term vitamin K antagonists. And what they showed was that those folks were getting higher concentrations of calcium building up in their vessels. Now, that doesn't mean if you're on a vitamin K antagonist, you want to stop it. You just want to know about it and be able to have that discussion with your doctor going on. Even when it comes to heart disease, there's some really interesting data about the benefits of K2 going on. So when we look at K2 in the Rotterdam study, this is a prospective study looking into the future and using food frequency questionnaire, what they found was that the highest concentration of K2 was actually linked to about a 26% 
lower risk of all-cause death and severe aortic calcification by about 52%. All right, how about K2 and bone health? You know, it's interesting to note that in Japan, K2 is actually given for osteoporosis. But in studies that we have, there's actually very promising results. So in a meta-analysis of seven studies, what it showed was that people who were taking K2, 45 milligrams per day, they actually had reduced their hip fracture risk by about 77% vertebral fractures by about 60% and non-vertebral fractures by about 81%. So K2, when it comes to things like osteoporosis, is actually very interesting. Even when it comes to things like diabetes, it plays a role. In fact, just 10 micrograms per day of K2 lowers the risk of developing diabetes by about 10%. And the benefits of K2 don't just stop there. If you were to go on and look at things like cancer, there's some very interesting studies in liver cancer, what we call hepatocellular carcinoma. And what it showed in one of the studies was that there was an 87% reduction in the risk of developing liver cancer versus the control group going on. Very, very fascinating. And not just that, even in terms of folks who had it and now were in remission, K2 can lower the risk of recurrence going on. Now, what's really fascinating, and we're going to have a whole separate discussion on this, is what is the risk when it comes to things like chronic kidney disease and K2? So there's this thing called D-phospho-uncarboxylated matrix GLA protein. Now, this is a mouthful. It's DPUC. MGP. You don't have to remember any of it. What you need to know about it is that it's linked with higher amounts of protein in the urine, with elevated serum creatinine levels, and other things. And in other words, the higher level that you have of this DPUC MGP protein, the more likely you are to have worsening kidney disease. And what's fascinating is, is just a little bit of vitamin K2. In this case, it was 90 micrograms. It actually results in a lowering of this dephospho-uncarboxylated matrix GLA protein. And in that particular study in 2016, it lowered it by about 10%. Now, this is correlation, meaning you're talking about a protein which is linked to these things. We don't have causation, but it's very, very fascinating. Another place where it's really fascinating is how K2 plays a role in your immune system. It actually does immunosuppression. So the reason it becomes so interesting is, is for folks who have autoimmune conditions, K2 may actually be beneficial in preventing the immune system from becoming overactive. More research to come on this, but this is actually a very, very interesting part. But one of the things that got me really excited about K2 and I actually supplement with K2 because I follow a whole food plant-based diet and it's hard to get except for natto, is this whole idea of how K2 is involved in protecting your brain. In fact, in studies, when looking at rat models, so this is animal model studies, what they show is that in those studies, there's improvements in short-term memory of these animals. There's improvement in spatial learning, how well they can kind of maneuver around the mazes. And there's overall reduction in memory impairment, which means that their memories are preserved longer going on. Now, lastly, what is fascinating about K2 is K2 also has a role possibly in obesity. So in some randomized control studies going on, what they've showed is, is that folks that actually have higher levels of K2 tend to have a decrease in things like abdominal fat, in things like visceral fat going on. There's more research to come, but the bottom line here is that K2 is involved in so many amazing things inside your body, whether it's dealing with your liver health, with hepatocellular carcinoma, with kidney disease worsening, it may actually lower it, with things like your heart system, so lower the risk of all-cause mortality, heart disease, arterial stiffness going on. It may be helpful in osteoporosis, preventing it, lowering the risk of fractures going on. It may actually be protective for your brain going on. And it may actually get rid of some of that unhealthy fat, the visceral fat that goes on in people. So lots more to come in terms of that, but it's a really interesting question. So I want to thank you so much for asking the question. If you have another question you want to hear about, send me an email, selfprincipal, S-E-L-F-P-R-I-N-C-I-P-L-E, -E, at gmail.com, and I'll be sure to address it in the next episode. Thanks so much, everyone.